Hi, I was asked to talk today about how I got into Huntington's disease. And so I've crafted this title in a way that gives a choice, which I'm gonna let you decide uh, which was the reason, serendipity or fate. Before I start, I need to make disclosures, my connections to industry that relate to Huntington's disease. And then start from the very beginning that I actually grew up in Canada. I'm a Canadian uh, by birth. And so a lot of my personality derives from that. But I think that much of my uh, interest in science and the beginnings of uh, what led me to Huntington's disease actually came from upstate New York. Uh, as a child, I read this wonderful series of books, probably one of the best sets of children's books ever uh, written uh, about uh, farm animals in upper New York state. And uh, Freddie the, the, the pig was actually the star of the show. Uh, he was known as a renaissance pig that fulfilled various roles from detective to political advisor uh, uh, to newspaper editor and so on but th the lessons i learned by reading this whole series of about 26 books uh, really covered a lot of what i needed to learn and and which uh, molded my personality i think i've often said my philosophy of life comes from the freddie the pig books but also my love of science came from those books. Now, at the time that I was in high school, uh, Marjorie Guthrie was starting the Committee to Combat Huntington's Disease, which later became the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And while I did not know that, I, my interest in science did cause me to do a lot of reading. And so I actually was aware of Huntington's disease. I uh, I had uh, read about it, thought it was fascinating, and, and I kind of had a premonition that someday I was going to reconnect with it in some way, even though I didn't know anyone who had it, had no relatives uh, who had it. So when I then went on to university, I started at the University of Ottawa, which is the, the hometown university uh, in the biology department. They had a very uh, traditional biology department. We studied things like axolotls and electric eels and uh, salt-loving bacteria. And in particular, a lot of the biology was dominated by the fact that the Ottawa River uh, was a, a, a source of uh, economic boon to the area. And I studied blue-green algae on the slime of fish in that river. It was actually quite interesting. But what I really came away with uh, was an interest in the, the field of molecular biology, which at the time was not terribly evolved. Uh, and I decided when I finished that I wanted to do graduate work because I thought that pre-medical uh, work uh, leading to medicine was too much memorization and not enough experimentation. So I wanted to go to Caltech or to MIT uh, moving to the U.S., thinking I could go to one of the best institutions down there. And Caltech and MIT both really interested me. But during college, I had met my bride-to-be, and we had not yet gotten married. She was in medical school. We planned to get married. And so I decided to forego going to the United States and uh, to go to graduate school at the best place I could in Canada, which was the University of Toronto. Now at the University of Toronto, uh, the department I joined actually had a wing at the Princess Margaret Hospital where the research was done in a place where cancer patients were also present. In fact, the lunchroom was shared between the researchers and the cancer patients. So we were exposed every day to the people that our research was impacting on. It was a very interesting place, but on the first day that I arrived to do my work, my uh, advisor, David Hausman, announced that he was actually moving the next year, that he was going to go down to MIT. So I then had a choice. Was I going to get married or was I uh, going to move? And that was a difficult choice, but it was made easier by something that was happening uh, at the time in the provincial government. I will say that when I started university, just so that you understand uh, the personality basics, when I started university, they gave a values test. And you were tested in your, your values. Uh, the, the entire student body actually was tested for values. Uh, 
and uh, what, what they thought was important. And I scored, I think, the lowest score they ever got uh, for the value of politics. But I got one of the higher scores that they ever got for the value of science. So at the time that I had to make a decision of staying in Canada or moving to where I had wanted to go in the first place, which is MIT, uh, I was faced with politics again. My wife to be, Maria, was to transfer from the University of Ottawa Medical School to the University of Toronto Medical School for us to get married. And politics, long story, but I won't and I won't go into it, actually prevented transfers during the time that she was in school. So she had to stay in Ottawa, at which point I said, OK, I'm going to to move to Boston uh, with David and to uh, undertake the next part of my research in a new environment in the cancer center at MIT. And uh, just as a background, what was beginning at that time was a field called recombinant DNA technology. And what recombinant DNA technology was, was a, a set of technologies that it, developed during the 1970s uh, and were just coming to the fore when I started my graduate work. They involved the ability to take little bits of DNA and to put that DNA into bacterial cells and grow it so you had lots of a particular piece of DNA. So it was recombinant in the sense that you were recombining the DNA from whatever source you had with bacterial DNA, and then you could grow the bacteria and you have lots of that original source DNA, but only the one piece that you put into the bacteria. Now, human DNA, there's about 3 billion bases of it, and it's packaged into chromosomes, and you have pairs of chromosomes that you got, one from each parent, uh, 22 pairs, not counting the sex chromosomes, and then the sex chromosomes, it's either X or Y. And each one of those is a very long string of DNA, and there's about 25,000 or more genes spaced out on those chromosomes. They're, they're, they are viewed as chromosomes because they're not just the string of DNA, they're the string of DNA packaged by a lot of proteins, which gives them bulk. Uh, but we, don't, we didn't know at the time anything about those genes. We knew that a few of them existed. We didn't know the sequence of any of them. Uh, we simply knew that they represented traits that were inherited in families. Uh, that could be followed. So when I went to David's lab, recombinant DNA was just starting. Uh, and it, it was thrilling to, to think of the idea of being able to look at the blueprint or operating software for the entire human body and to be able to pull out individual little pieces of it uh, by isolating these bits of DNA and then sequencing them to understand what they were. So I began a thesis project that was aimed at isolating one of the most important genes known at the time, and that was the genes for the globin that formed part of your hemoglobin uh, carrying oxygen and red blood cells. And it was a natural because with David, I had worked on uh, a cancer called erythroleukemia uh, with cells that actually made uh, uh, the hemoglobins. So uh, it, it, you know, it was a gene that was natural to clone. My thesis project, however, uh, reached a very quick stop because I happened to be at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, MIT had a uh, problem with doing recombinant DNA work, and that was the mayor of Cambridge, who believed that the recombinant DNA work was going to create monsters and, and in fact, had evidence uh, from the Boston Herald American of people citing monsters uh, and thinking that they were due to recombinant DNA work. So in fact, all recombinant DNA work on uh, mammalian cells, mice and humans was blocked very early on by a moratorium that prevented me from doing the project that I wanted to do. And it was only later after several couple of years that we were allowed under very strict conditions to isolate bits of human DNA. Um, but by that time, all the interesting genes that would have made sense for me to isolate had been done by people who were not in Cambridge, some of whom moved from Cambridge to other places to be able to do it. However, I did graduate. I graduated from MIT, not based on isolating a particular bit of human DNA that I knew was a gene, I 
developed a technique for isolating little bits of DNA based on where they came from on the chromosomes. So it was possible for me to get a, 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 an anonymous piece of DNA that came, let's say, from chromosome 11, uh, and to be able to, to uh, look at it and sequence it without knowing what it was, just that it, where it came from. And this comes into play subsequently with, with Huntington's disease, as you'll see. So the next step for a person who's gotten a PhD from one of these institutions is to go on to postdoctoral training, where you go to another scientific lab separate from the, the first one you were in, uh, and you focus very hard on some particular problem and learn the basics of becoming an independent investigator. And so I actually, in keeping with my previous goals, made the decision to go to Caltech for uh, postdoctoral work. And I was going to train at Caltech with an eminent scientist uh, isolating antibody genes, genes, certain genes that hadn't yet been isolated uh, and made sense. So my plan to go to Caltech was very clear cut. I actually had fellowships written. I was ready to go. And I uh, went to visit to talk to my advisor about the project. And I immediately hit two roadblocks. One of them was that uh, this was now uh, the very late 70s. The smog in LA was completely unbearable. I, I couldn't believe people lived in that smog. It, it just uh, boggled the mind to think of working for several years in an environment where you never knew whether it was going to be sunny or whether there was going to be fog. Uh, and the other was that it turned out California was one of two places in the country where my wife's Canadian medical training uh, didn't count, even though she had done all her subsequent residency training in the US. And so uh, we were uh, basically really kind of crestfallen at the idea of moving to California to do this. And, and she wouldn't be able to work. She'd have to write exams before she could do it. And I'd have to breathe the smog. Uh, so we, we flew back kind of disheartened back to Boston, it was an eventful flight back. She was a uh, pediatrician by training, but she ended up in first class taking care of an individual who had a heart attack along the way and there were no other physicians on board. I sat in the back in uh, coach and uh, I actually honestly was reading a Freddie book because Although they were out of print at the time, I had found a discard from one of the libraries in Pasadena that I had bought and uh, therefore had that to read, uh, a consistency in my life of reading Freddie. So when I got back to Boston, uh, disheartened, I actually uh, perked up because of a tremendous opportunity that arose because of Joe Martin that, that, that derived, in fact, from Marjorie Guthrie. Marjorie Guthrie had headed a federal commission uh, that uh, was, was aimed because of her lobbying at, at saying what could be done about Huntington's disease. And one of the decisions that they made was to set up research centers. And Joe Martin, who had moved from Canada to Mass General Hospital across the river from MIT, decided to apply for one of those centers. And he wanted to be innovative and not just have the traditional neurology approaches. He wanted to have molecular biology applied to Huntington's disease. And so I was given the opportunity to skip postdoctoral training and to immediately set up my own lab uh, at the Mass General Hospital to work on Huntington's disease. Now I say I was given this opportunity. I was given this opportunity on the assumption that the grant got funded. I actually had three months of salary, and if the grant didn't get funded, I'd have to go look for another postdoctoral position. Uh, but fortunately, the grant did get funded, and I was able to begin working on Huntington's disease in 1980. The, the work that I envisioned was one that uh, I thought of and I continued to think of as a cycle that begins with patients and their families that applies the rules of genetics to identifying the gene that underlies the disease, that then uses all the power of experimental biology and model systems to 
figure out how that gene works and then returns benefit to the patients and families by virtue of better diagnosis, better disease management and prevention, uh, and better, especially better therapies based on the mechanism of the disease rather than on trial and error. And so this is what I set out to do for Huntington's disease. Uh, the same cycle was subsequently applied to many other diseases. And in fact, I later built a center uh, for human genetic research at the Mass General Hospital based on this strategy. But it all came from this beginning effort in Huntington's disease. Now, I was thrilled that the grant was funded, but unfortunately, my strategy required that I be able to apply the rules of genetics and the molecular biology to patients and families. And the component of the grant that was to supply those families was not funded. So I was left in the position of having to identify families to study uh, without being a physician, being a PhD, and while I'm sitting in a hospital, you know, I'm at just one location, uh, there are not that many Huntington's disease patients, and even the physicians there were just learning about Huntington's disease. Fortunately, uh, enter two critical individuals in the picture. One was Mike Keneally uh, at Indiana University, who ran the HD roster, which was another suggestion from this commission that a research roster be set up to catalog families who were willing to participate in research. And through, through Mike, we began to collect families. Um, and when I say collect families, I mean we would receive blood samples sent in the mail to be able to analyze the DNA extracted from those samples. The other critical individual, and in fact, the person who put me in touch with Mike in the first place was Nancy Wexler who uh, was working at the NIH at the time and was the project officer on our grant, but who decided on her own to go and investigate a very large Huntington's disease cluster in Venezuela and to start sending blood samples back to us for study. So uh, the combination of those two provided the families that were needed, a number of American families and this very large Venezuelan family. The Venezuelan one in particular sticks in my mind because while the, the American families, we would receive the blood by FedEx and be able to work with it right away, uh, the getting bloods out of Venezuela was a, a trial and they had to be uh, get through customs in Miami and then be switched to another flight. And we would use we would go and pick them up at night to make sure that we could get them to the lab. So I would I would go to the airport, pick up these packages of dozens and dozens of bloods. Uh, bring them home, uh, wait until the next morning, bring them in, and then start first thing in the morning to work on them. Uh, leave the box on the desk in, in my office to be discarded later. And I remember one day Nancy called from Venezuela, and I'm sitting at my desk with the box there, and I noticed that there's a little trail of ants walking across the desk, these little red ants. I immediately called my wife to say, Hey, look where I left that box last night and lo and behold, uh, there was a trail of ants there as well because the ants had set up a nest inside the corrugated cardboard that uh, uh, was used for the, sending the blood samples and had emerged the next morning. This is one of many things that happened along the way between ants and cockroaches and various things um, that were really um, an experience in dealing with bloods from another country. But, but they were critical for our research, because it was such a large family, we were able to track variations in DNA patterns through them and, and determine whether any of those tracked with Huntington's disease. And that led to the discovery of a marker, a bit of DNA that came from chromosome four. And of course, the reason I decided to do this was I had a technique for isolating DNA from particular regions of chromosomes but I didn't know what region of chromosome contained the Huntington's disease gene. So this marker told me that it was somewhere on chromosome four. And the pattern of DNA tracked in families and enabled the tracking of the Huntington's disease gene, even into individuals who hadn't yet shown onset of the disease. So the advent of the marker allowed the first predictive testing within families for uh, Huntington's disease. But it also gave us a spot on the chromosome to move from to isolate the gene. 
we did this so early on that people looked at it and said, wow, this is a powerful technique, but, but it would be easier if we had all the information in hand. And so let's start a human genome project. Uh, and this, this discovery gave great impetus to the idea for human genome project, but it left us in a position of having to move from the bit of DNA on the chromosome to somewhere else on the chromosome that actually contained the actual defect that was the gene without the technologies having yet been developed to really do that. So one thing we needed was we needed a lot more families and the research community and the HD community came through with that worldwide. We identified families from all around the world. At this point, I was joined by a colleague who remains a close collaborator to this day, and that was Marcy McDonald. And together, we mapped the Huntington's disease gene to the short arm of chromosome four, to a region near the tip of the short arm of chromosome four. And we identified a whole bunch of markers along with the other folks in the lab that were uh, present near the Huntington's disease gene. When, when I say near, I mean within 100 million bases of it, so not, not so close. Um, but we identified markers that were near the Huntington's disease gene and uh, wanted to be able to isolate it, found that we could home in using the families, but we needed additional technologies. And part of that work of building those technologies and applying them to Huntington's disease was via the Huntington's Disease Collaborative Research Group, a, a, a group of international investigators that worked with us uh, to develop technologies, and a number of them are shown here from one of our early meetings in Isla Mirada, where Dennis Shea, who was a great benefactor, uh, made available his place on Isla Mirada for meetings every once in a while of this group. You'll see Francis Collins, who just stepped down as head of NIH at the very back of this. He was one of the, the group of collaborators. And ultimately, the combination of this and technologies, this, the families that we had and the technologies that were developed led to us mapping a very small region of chromosome four, uh, finding out that there were multiple different origins of the Huntington's disease uh, mutation. It had occurred many times in human history, not just once. Uh, and by homing in on that region, we found eventually the gene itself to be an expanded repeat of CAG in the DNA, one of those four letters that, were, that make up the DNA. Uh, that were repeated over and over again. And on Huntington's disease chromosomes, that is chromosomes that lead to Huntington's disease, uh, the repeat was just too long. And it was uh, a repeat that was unstable in the sense that as it was passed from generation to generation, it changed, typically getting bigger. And when it got bigger um, and got to be above 35 CAGs in a row, it caused Huntington's disease. So this opened up a new world at this point. And you know, the, the original discovery of the marker pretty much was the most amazing thing that I had experienced up until that time, knowing something uh, that no one else knew, having discovered it through science, and, and immediately knowing that, well, this set the rest of your career for the next you know, number of years, you're gonna be working on this particular disease. And then to wait 10 years while techniques were developed for the relief of actually isolating the gene itself was another indescribable sort of emotional moment. But it also then pointed to what was going to happen afterwards, the need to understand how that gene worked, because although the, the discovery of the gene uh, improved predictive testing, it meant you could test individuals rather than having to have families for the presence of this expanded repeat, it didn't tell us what the gene did, and it didn't tell us how the gene caused the disease. And so there needed to be technologies applied to try to understand that. The, the gratifying thing was this discovery started to attract a lot more interest in the scientific community, a lot more interest uh, in researchers who wanted to work on the disease. It coincided with the beginning of the Huntington Study Group, uh, set up to try to drive clinical trials in Huntington's disease. And there were even the first inklings of in, interest from industry at this point in whether it was possible to use this knowledge to do something about Huntington's disease. And so we, we participated in that. By this time, I had gathered a group of collaborators uh, and we 
approached it with a variety of different techniques. Uh, Marcy McDonald is still around, but Jung Min Lee with genetics, In Sang Sik with protein chemistry, Vanessa Wheeler looking at instability in mouse models of the repeat, Jim Walker looking at fruit flies and what Huntington what the Huntington's disease gene did in fruit flies. We, and we've participated in trying to understand what the defect does, but we've partic particularly persisted in the idea that while the human genetics led to the cause of Huntington's disease, it could also lead to clues for how to treat it by again going back and looking at the individuals with Huntington's disease themselves and looking at their DNA and understanding what impact it has beyond the variation that causes Huntington's disease. And the first thing that led us to that concept was the fact that the age of onset of the disease was not identical in every individual who had a particular CAG repeat, uh, even though there was a trend for longer repeats to lead to earlier onset of disease. And on this graph where I've plotted age of onset against CAG repeat length, we can find people who have the same repeat, but 20 years later onset than, than the average for that repeat or 20 years earlier onset than the average for that repeat. And the reason for this is largely because of other genetic variations that they carry that modify the onset of Huntington's disease. So in essence, we looked at the human genetics as being nature having already performed a successful trial. There was an agent in nature in the human genome that could delay onset for a given CAG repeat length. And it left it to us to try to find that particular variant. And it turns out there are more than, there's more than one. Uh, there are also variations that can cause onset to be earlier, which are, uh, while themselves not a good thing, they are useful for investigation of the mechanisms that are involved and could become targets for uh, treatment. So how did we go about this? We go about it by looking at the DNA across not just the region where the Huntington's disease gene is, but across the entire genome. And we need, as you can tell from looking at that cycle, more patients, more individuals who carry the gene. And of course, the Huntington's disease community has been tremendously uh, helpful in us carrying out our research. In fact, we couldn't do our research since we do human genetics without the participation of HD patients and their families. And in this case, the clinical researchers had been setting up, subsequent to our original genetic discoveries, observational trials, uh, clinical trials of various types, and ultimately, after the Huntington Study Group and the uh, European Huntington's Disease Network led the way with these kinds of studies, uh, the CHDI Foundation and its Enroll HD platform is now the largest collection of individuals. And, and these individuals have supplied blood samples for DNA and information concerning their disease that's captured by the clinical researchers who work with them. So it's a it's an enormous effort by a lot of people, uh, and it produces DNA that has interesting information attached to it. You will have noticed on the slide the word phenotype. The phenotype basically is just the descriptive information about the disease, and uh, we had it in this case. And the question is, are there genetic variations that correlate with that uh, variation in expression of the disease? And in looking world uh, genome-wide, We've identified now nine of those different genes. Six of those genes, it turns out, all participate in the same process. And that is a process by which the CAG repeat changes in size. It gets bigger. It's called CAG instability. And where is, where is this happening? This is actually happening in the cells of your body where not every cell after a number of years has the identical sized repeat. The repeat can grow larger uh, and the rate at which that happens can depend on which of these genes you have that are modifiers of the disease. So now we're going around the cycle again. We're starting with, with patients. We're applying the rules of genetics in a slightly different way than we did before, but we're trying to uh, identify not the disease gene, which we already have, 
but other genes that modify how that disease gene is expressed. And then we work our way back around the cycle, trying to again, produce benefit. In this case, where the modifier genes are themselves potential targets for developing a treatment. And it turns out that this has led to a different understanding of Huntington's disease that provides two phases that may be targetable. And that is that the disease appears to have two parts. The first part is this phase during which the, the CAG repeat in certain cells gets larger. And until it gets larger, there's no permanent damage being done. But when it reaches a threshold of some length that remains to be determined, uh, it triggers toxicity. And, and that's when the damage starts being done. So you've got two phases, a phase in which somatic instability or CAG repeat size changes, and then a phase in which the result of that causes toxicity and cell death. And the genes involved in these are different. So the genes involved in the first phase uh, relate to DNA repair and, and, and uh, genes that manipulate the DNA. And we have, as I said, now six of those that all participate in making the instability either greater or lesser. And of course, some of these are now already targets for treatment being developed in industry. And then for the second phase, it's a little less certain and probably more diverse. We have some genes that we believe apply to that second phase, but they don't yet fall into a single pathway that tells us this is the critical one. So they're all being looked at individually to determine it. But we also are continuing to do these studies. And we're continuing to do them as part of a large consortium, again, because cooperation and collaboration is the way to get things done. Uh, the consortium is, again, an international one, the GEMHD group. And none of it would be possible if it wasn't for the participation of families. So I started out in Huntington's disease uh, in 1980. I continue to do it. Human genetics is still the theme and the critical component of human genetics, the thing that has actually driven the Huntington's disease field forward. The, the reason why there is a great interest in industry for developing a treatment and in academia for understanding the mechanisms is all because of the willingness of HD patients to participate in research and what they have given us over time. So for that, I thank you and I will stop here and hopefully there'll be some questions.